Hi, in this episode of Resilient Business, I speak with Dr. Noda Hashimoto of Palm Springs, California. Dr. Hashimoto runs a wellness practice, including chiropractic, regenerative therapies, and other modalities and approaches. He's also created a software package that helps manage the wellness practice that's been implemented at over 100 locations around the country. I hope you enjoy this episode. If you like what you see on Resilient Business, please like, comment, and subscribe. Also, check out my affiliate relationships below for some great products and great discounts. Hope you enjoy. A lot of the people I talk to these days, especially in the wellness business, um, seem to have their own personal story of need that projected them (laughs) onto a path to get into wellness, whether it's chiropractic or functional. It's the same thing here. It's not like something people don't aspire to have their kids grow up to get into the wellness industry. That's so right. That's, no one that's thinks essentially that when they're seven years old. If you ask a seven year old, what do you want to be when you grow up? Very few of them say chiropractor. I wanted to play in the MLB. Didn't quite make it. <laughs> yep. I know. So did I. What position did you play? Short, third, second, catcher. I was too small to be a catcher, but I was able to throw hard. And Catcher's I probably the a, only thing I never played, but I played everything else. Yeah. Yep. So it was, um, yeah, it was it was fun. I had a lot of my best memories growing up were related to baseball. And I never pushed my kids into baseball because I didn't want them to go into baseball because I liked it and I knew it. So I got them into every other sport but baseball. And then when the pandemic happened, everything shut down except for baseball because it was outside. Yeah, the boys started playing in the pandemic and they went from never playing baseball to now they both made travel ball teams after one year of working with them quite a bit and then like rec league. So like, yeah, like they did other sports fine. Um, I just didn't want them to feel like I pressured them into it. I'm glad that they kind of found it. We found it organically. And since I didn't force it on them, they like doing it. Sure. Yeah. Makes total sense. So your journey then to get into wellness, um, you know, not unlike a lot of other folks started with a need. Um, so how did your journey start and when did you decide to do what you're doing now and take us Take us, give us a little history lesson on what got you where you are now. Yeah, it's actually started when I was eight. Uh, Like, grew up very little means. Um, You know, we weren't like, we were probably like upper lower class. We definitely weren't middle class. Um, You know, like Christmas would be like, you know, like it was like 30 to $40 for your annual gifts like which you know we so we got the stuff like um you know i'm talking about baseball like i was the only kid that played on the travel team when i was little that couldn't afford cleats and eventually like i slipped on first because uh on a hit the wall and uh got a single so just so we just grew up no choices everything was always about like how much it costs we got the kind of cereal we got was the cheapest one that was on the bottom shelf. And it, yeah. So for some reason it just bugged me. It was never, we never had choices. We couldn't go out to eat, you know? So like we weren't homeless, but like we definitely, you know, like if it was a field trip and it cost $20 to go on a field trip, my parents, it was an easy thing. It was no. So I had to sit at school by myself while all the other kids went and I get extra homework. So the first time, first time I saw someone that really had choices, a lot of choices, I was talking to the dad and I uh, found out that he was a business owner. He said he was an entrepreneur. And I remember coming home and telling my mom saying, I want to be a business owner. And that's kind of like when the idea popped into my head. And then some of my mom's cousins were dentists. They had businesses, they were in healthcare. So that's kind of like the trajectory I was going on first. I was originally planning on pro- playing professional baseball, like all of us were very naively if you thought you were pretty good. And then uh, those dreams get crushed fairly quickly. And then uh, I was like, okay, I'll be a dentist. I actually did pre-dental. I was going into uh, the summer before I was going to go to dental school. 
I was on my way to work for my summer job and uh, some guy came flying around a corner uh, trying to make a right hand turn down a side street and he lost control and he came flying into my lane and hit me head on. So at the time I was very allopathic like a lot of us were before we got into the weird wellness industry and did the normal thing like did physical therapy, went to the ER, took medications. I did have improvements so it's not like it but like after about six months of going one to three times a week, um, I had headaches. If I sat down and looked down for over 20 minutes, um, I'd have a searing stabbing pain that would turn into like an ice pick, just stabbing my butt after about 20 to 30 minutes. And I was 21. So uh, it took my doctor wanting to send me to an orthopedic surgeon before I saw like sought out other means of care. And uh, knowing what I know now, I know that an orthopedic surgeon wasn't gonna do surgery, but like when you're 21, they say, I need to send you an orthopedic surgeon, you start to panic. And then my mom said, you need to go see Tony Torelli's um, doctor and saw a family friend. And um, you know, he told me about his doctor he went to. And that's the first time I was introduced to the concept of chiropractic. I had no idea what the heck it was, but I knew that I wanted to try anything before I tried seeing the surgeon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, lo and behold, I get better uh, going to the chiropractor within one week. And within two months, all my acne went away, changed my diet. You know, he didn't fix it with just adjusting my spine. He, it was a lifestyle change. He got me, you know, I was doing the exercises with physical therapy, but he encouraged me. I need to do these exercises every day. I need to do this daily. I need to change my diet, reduce my inflammation. He introduced me to paleo before paleo was a thing. And that was in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, it changed my life. He got rid of my acne, got rid of my headache, got rid of my neck pain, got rid of my back pain, got rid of my sciatic pain. And, you know, this guy just did it with his hands and with diet and lifestyle. And it was enough for me to tell my parents to say that I don't want to be a dentist. I want to do this weird thing called chiropractic. And people that get into the wellness thing, a lot of them, they start with a need. They start with a pain because it's not normal. You don't see like TV shows with George Clooney uh, being like this naturopathic doctor doing PEMF and diet and lifestyle stuff. So it just... And it's... Uh, I think everything kind of happens to us for a reason. And... It just, I was going down the wrong path. And it's not that it was a wrong path. It was just the wrong path for me. So, you know, God or universe, whatever you want to call it, just kind of, I feel like just kind of corrects us. And uh, that was a correction. That's kind of where I met my wife. And a lot of this, my life has changed because of that. Like I got introduced to uh, a chiropractic mentor that got me into like the whole self-help thing introduced me to Zig Ziglar, Dale Carnegie, Napoleon Hill. And that has like just changed my life. And then, um, you know, then I wanted to keep learning. And then from there, you know, you finish school and that's like when the learning just began. So like I actually did multiple postceptors. I went and worked for one of my mentors who offered me less money than um, other people were offering me, but I wanted to sharpen my tools rather than just go out there and earn a check. And then by doing that, it allowed me to kind of move up past all my classmates way faster than them because a lot of them are still grinding away. And, you know, like out of all the people I went to class with, it was like, everyone's like, holy crap. I was like, how'd you get there? So, and it happened from sharp my axe a lot. Sure. A lot of learning, a lot of ownership in your situation, right? And your own improvement. I think that's a key takeaway to what you've said is that, you know, once a lot of times, once you take ownership on the process of improving, whether it be learning or your healthy lifestyle, what have you, um, that's a key, that's a key tenet to success. It's discipline. Yeah. It's ownership. Yep. No, absolutely. So then what happened next? I was just learning a bunch and then I worked for my guy for a year and I knew it was kind of like time to move on. And my wife wanted to move. We were in Seattle at the time and moved. She wanted to move back to California because it was too cloudy and rainy. 
Um, so we came back down to Southern California to be close to her family. So we came out in the Palm Springs area uh, where she's familiar with. And uh, yeah, just started grinding and uh, did, we did pretty well out here. Like I remember ninth month into practice, I was renting a room and we crossed that 62,500 barrier in my ninth month when I was renting a room for 400 bucks a month with one staff. <laughs> so we did, we did, we did all right. But uh, one of the skills that a lot of people they really have to learn how to do is selling. Um, selling is something that my mentor taught me because like when I first got introduced to the concept of selling, I thought it was a bad word. I thought it was like I had to get snakeskin alligator boots, get a mustache, uh, start slanging like used cars. Like I just thought selling was like the dirtiest thing. And then selling, he just says, if you're selling something that is good for the other person, it's your moral obligation and duty to get good at it. And selling is just that transfers to energy. And uh, there's a book, Anthony Iannaro, he talks about this kind of, he just said, selling is something you do for someone, not to someone. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I kind of got that idea that I'm doing something for someone, not to someone, you're selling them an idea of their future state, their future self, and getting them to follow through on that. And once I realized that, it's like, I need to get good at selling. And so I started studying sales books and getting really good at that. And that was like the first skill uh, that I really got good at. And I'd say, if you get really good at selling, that's going to take you half a million dollars. You could probably get up to that point just by getting really, really, really good at sales. Mm -hmm. And uh, at a certain point, you're going to have to learn about marketing. You're going to have to learn about hiring people. Uh, ramping them up, growing a team, and then obviously the financials, because if you don't know your finances or your forecasting, you get into trouble fairly quickly. But it's yeah. um, selling, like, talk about the journey, but like, yeah, it was uh, selling. And then like uh, my mentor kind of got me into the concept of like direct response marketing, which, you know, there's a lot of books out there. I'd say Dan Kennedy uh, has got a ton of content on there. That would be like a really good spot. But like once you get good at selling and marketing, you know, the sky is the limit. And then obviously you got to learn how to grow a team around you. But uh, from there, you know, like single doctor practice, having a handful of staff, we took that to 1.8 million. Then I decided to add medical into the clinic for some reason, thinking that I was going to affect more people, which theoretically you do, but I don't think I really uh, reached out into the community that much more uh, than we were just straight chiropractic. So we added that. We were able to um, double the revenue at that point, but our overhead more than doubled at that point. And then um, I was doing a good job marketing for our clinic and, and a number of people reach out to me to ask for like help and consulting. And then I got into, um, cause it, the, one of the things I did to grow my practice quite a bit was doing a lot of these educational talks for existing patients, but I'd set up these educational talks where you get like 20 to 40 people in a room and you do like your talk. Cause like we didn't do any insurance. So I was doing a lot of, uh, information first marketing. So, you know, putting them in a room, doing like, uh, 45 minute presentation about kind of like how we deal with pain relief and how we get you better. And then the most interested people come in there because a lot of our programs are like, you know, 3000 to 13,000 in that kind of a price range right there. Uh, we do have some now at like that $1,500 point, which are much smaller and tighter plans. But that was like a lot of the marketing that I was doing pre COVID and then um, started doing that for other people. And that's stem cells were really big and we were doing a fair bit of stem cells at the time. So then we were actually doing 100 to 200 stem cell seminars for other practices around the country. So I had my practice and then I had uh, that stem cell seminar business and then um, ended up making a software uh, to run our practice because we had seven providers. So we had three medical providers, a physical therapist, two chiropractic providers, massage therapists, and it was fairly complicated. And uh, we had a CRM, a texting platform that integrated with our practice management system, 
several spreadsheets, had Infusionsoft, and then had like another platform uh, that we that integrated for stats uh, for our office. And it was a hot mess. So then I ended up making a software that um, called TrackStat that um, integrates, integrated with our touch and now it integrates with other things because I need to simplify it. So we talked about journey. So all those things have kind of happened. And then like when COVID happened, um, that stem cell seminar business kind of like went like this. And I put like a lot of the resources into the software business. And then that software business has been taken off more and more. And then as it's taken up more and more of my um, attention units per se, I've actually started been contracting my practice more and more and more because um, one of the things keys to success I always find is um, focus. And you only have so many attention units. I think of them as plates that I could spin and I know how many plates I could spin. And one of the plates is like spending time with the kids. One of the plates is like being a good husband. Mm -hmm. And like, those are a couple plates I'm just not willing to drop. So, yeah. Interesting. A lot of different pieces and parts coming together. And again, out of necessity, you create the software package. Yep. You know, we need it. We got too much to manage here. We got to, you know, centralize it and, and, and figure out how to leverage all the information, et cetera. So let's create a software package. So take us down that road. What has that been like? Um, you know, what just describe for us what it does, who, who you work with, who uses well, it, like, those um, types of things. Yeah, like getting into it. Like, yeah, it was uh, hard. It's hard getting into things that you don't know much about um, because the uh, scary part for me was like just getting into something and not knowing that much about it. Like, I can't tell you if you're the Michael Jordan of code or the Kwame Brown of code, right? Like, I can't tell who's like a superstar and who's a faker and stuff like that. <laughs> and so um, whenever I have a new thing that I need to conquer, I need to figure out, is it a how problem or is it a who problem? And I always try to go for the who's. Because uh, a how is you got to read books and just figure out, turn yourself into the expert so you could do it. But the much faster way of getting there is finding the who's. So like, you know, I went to college with a couple of guys that worked for Google, where I uh, know a guy that works at Microsoft and, you know, just talked to them about hiring people. And then they just told me like how it'd be very difficult for me to tell if they were good or not. And I talked to one of my friends that's like a, non-technical like uh, SaaS founder. And then he gave me actually a lot of good advice because he's kind of like more like me, more of a techie type person, but he can't sit there and write code. Mm -hmm. um, so like talk to him a fair bit and um, he kind of helped me hire the first person. And that first person has been like a rock star person that has accountability and ownership and has helped me hire the other people after that. Um, so that part has been instrumental, but yeah, you just, first you got to get in there and then yeah, getting the software going, it never got started because I wanted to turn this into a business. It was just solving my own personal pain. And then like, you know, a friend says, Hey, that's pretty cool. Can I use that? And then a friend of a friend calls me up and said, Hey, my buddy, Chris says that you got this thing for ChiroTouch. Can you, um, put it into our clinic too? And I was like, yeah, sure. And like, I just did that out of curiosity to see, is there some kind of an interest here? And then I remember 2019, September, 2019, I was actually thinking about killing my seminar business. I was um, listening to a talk from uh, Ryan Levesque and um, or Ryan LeVay, and he's the guy that does the ask method. So he came and talked to this mastermind group I was a part of, and he talked about like he had this two and a half million dollar a year business that he destroyed and uh, built it back up into a $10 million a year business. And he said, sometimes you have to break everything down and build it back up to build it into something bigger. And he had this story about Lego that, you know, he related with it. And that got me kind of like thinking, because like at the time, I was just working way too much. Uh, we were making good money. Like I remember I crossed the seven figure barrier for take home for the first time. 
And it was, I thought it was going to just change my whole life and fucking didn't. <laughs> like, I was not happy at the time. I wasn't unhappy, but I missed everything. Like, you know, at the very beginning of this, we were like just wrapping on them, talking about my kids' baseball and stuff like that. But I missed everything. Every spelling bee, every recital, mm -hmm. every jujitsu thing, every tennis tournament. Like I missed not everything, but I missed a lot of things because I was always working. I was always gone. And it just, and I remember like my dad passed away in 2020 and like, you know, he had cancer. So it was like happening gradually over a period of time. And like, he never talked about like opportunities that he missed about, you know, wishing that he would have made more money and stuff like that. It was just memories, experiences. And like towards the end, he was trying to find meaning and purpose in his life, which he eventually came to, it was for his kids and that's what he lived for. And I just remember thinking like, I was sitting there in that talk coming out of there. And it was like, if I died, if I died next week, who's going to miss me? Aside from my family, aside from some of my friends. And it's like, what am I standing for? What did, what was my purpose? What was I put on this planet for? And, you know, just doing a bunch of these like educational seminars, like I don't think is going to change the world. And that's when I said, it's like, if I'm going to change anything, um, I think that software thing is going to be how I do it. And that's kind of like when I knew I wanted to turn that software business into a business, but um, I just didn't have the time. And in reality, I was just making way too much money out of that seminar business and something else. And then when COVID happened, I was like, okay, I got all this extra free time and, you know, jump right into it. Yeah. Yeah. COVID, I mean, for, for the people I talk to, a lot of them talk about 2020 being a time where they they're looking at the silver lining, um, the opportunity to refocus, analyze, you know, what we have time. We're not running as fast. We're not flying every day. We're not doing the normal things that we do for business that are keeping us from looking kind of around the horizon a little bit and sort of thinking, what could I be doing differently? Um, what would I need to do differently after you know, the dust settles on this thing. If that ever happens, how am I going to come back out and sort of um, catapult from where I was before? And it's sort of what I did in my own personal business here and why I cr even created this podcast to begin with is that I knew that I wasn't necessarily going to be doing 20 trade shows a year for the next couple of years like I had done pre previously. And so in order for me to drive business, I have to do my business differently. I have to go more virtual. I have to scale things more. I have to figure out how to uh, convey a message on uh, a piece of equipment that is highly experiential without necessarily giving the buyer the experience every single time, which is tremendously challenging, <laughs> as you might imagine. Knowing the yeah. technology I'm talking about, you, you, you might imagine what I'm going through. Um, but there are ways to sort of navigate through that. And I think if you, if you look for ways of navigating versus dwelling on the fact that, well, shoot, it's never going to be the same as it always was, you know, what am I going to do type thing? And don't get frustrated because that just puts your, your mind in a state of inability. Um, you know, always keep an open mind, always try to be looking out at the horizon. And yes, out of necessity, again, comes, you know, hopefully the path to, to, to more success, um, consistency and all of that. So I appreciate that. So 2020 in general, you know, it impacted you like it impacted everybody else. Um, how did you kind of get through that? And what are some of the things you learned, you know, going through 2020? And even, I mean, even now it's still not totally well, back to normal and not sure. In, when in all be. honesty, like the, the first week, I probably shit my pants and freaked out like crazy. <laughs> it's like, not like that, but like the first week felt like a month. First month felt like uh, four months. Like it was crazy, but like uh, we pivoted very hard, very quickly. And um, 
I knew that there was a window on that stem cell seminar thing. And honestly, I didn't feel like pivoting into other verticals because there were things I liked about that kind of a business, uh, but there were things that I didn't like about it. And I didn't want to spend the rest of my life doing things I didn't want to do just because I was making money at it. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I have talents to do a lot of different things. And I want to do the things that make me happy that I create value for in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's it. If I get energy from doing it um, and I create value for others, then those are the things I love to do. And uh, so part of the part that was like a little bit freaky for me is because I've already been talking about all this stuff and what I wanted to do. And I actually made started the process of winding down the medical part of our practice because um, with the whole regenerative medicine, I knew there was a window on that. And I didn't want to jump back into the insurance medical. So um, to make it, uh, to feed the machine per se, uh, what we had is we'd have to do just a lot more hyaluronic acid injections, fluoroscopic injections, facet injections, and all these different um, uh, bigger ticket items um, through insurance. And I just, I didn't want to do that. So um, we started the process of winding that down right away. And then the seminar thing, I just knew that I didn't feel like doing that, but like, for me, it took a lot of courage to say, okay, I'm going to hire another developer on top of the one I already have and start sinking more money into this software business, um, knowing that it's not going to really be fruitful for a while. Like it takes like some cojones to start dropping like 15, 20,000 a month every single month when you lose cash flow and some of your other things. Mm -hmm. um, but fortunately, I've been a pretty good steward of my finances over the years. Uh, made a decent amount of money and I'm not fancy, like drive a Lexus, like I could drive a fancier car if I wanted to, but um, I've been pretty good about that. So we had and still have a nice little war chest of cash where I was able to do that, get it going. And then we got it ready for market September, 2020, started selling that. And yeah, now like one year later, we've got like have over a hundred clinics using it. And by being able to push on that hard at the beginning, it allows us to get a number of clinics a lot faster rather than like uh, going in slowly. We just kind of went on right away we got to four developers fairly quickly mm -hmm. that's cool and we could probably do a sequel and just talk about that product and talk about you know who, who you sell it to what it does um and what the value prop is behind it and how you've gotten so much traction so quickly and you know i'm sure that'll continue to be successful um we could probably dedicate a, a whole you know part two of this discussion to that um yeah like i think it's the same thing as growing your wellness practice or anything else, like just figuring out who you serve, who you solve a problem for and just solve that problem for them really well. And ideally like making sure that the market size is big enough. Like, you know, for some of the people they say, it's like, Oh, I want to go serve like this group of people. It's like, well, how many of them are there in that area? And if there's not that many of them, I don't care if you solve that problem very well, there's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I just say, find your group of people, figure out who you could be a hero to. And uh, that's it. Just go be a hero to them. And if you are a hero to them over and over and over again, and you get your marketing dial then where you're calling out that person where you want to be a hero to them, be the guide to them, then um, that's pretty much it. But you got to figure out that niche, uh, that vertical or that specific group of people that you're targeting and... Once you figure that out and you start solving problems for them, you can start adding in other avatars, other groups of people that you can solve a problem for. Yeah. And that's why I think like the sales and marketing is it's a key part of scaling any business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the one thing I really love about the wellness business, obviously I've been in business, I've been in sales for the past almost 25 years and it's um, you mentioned it earlier, the wellness business is a bunch of salespeople, business people. 
and you guys make a living. You're entrepreneurial, and that's what I love. One of the things I love about the industry is the ability to do that. Um, not every doc, you know, very few docs on the on the sort of Western medical allopathic side of things um, know how to sell. Their business is just not operated that way. And um, I, re- I just really appreciate your guys' ability because but, it, it takes ownership, accountability, constant learning, and passion. And, and I think a lot of that comes out of personal necessity, the way a lot of people get into this. But it's just a passion for people, too, I think. But selling is, they do selling all the time. They just don't know it, right? Like when they're doing a prescription, you're selling them an the idea of taking that. Sure whatever or there's prescribing exercise prescribing diet lifestyle they're prescribing them to go to bed on time Mm -hmm. but it just selling is getting someone interested in this future state their future self and getting them to follow through on that and that's just really all selling is you're transferring that trust transferring that energy and you know as soon as i figured that out it was like well selling's actually It's good. I sell my kids on going to bed (laughs) on time all the time. I do a terrible job at it because like, I feel like I always have to sell them every night, go to bed, go to bed. (laughs) They, they eventually do it, but it's just, it's a struggle. Like, you know, like tonight I got to sell them on going to bed tomorrow. I got to, they act like it's the worst thing in the world. Bad. No, I don't want to do that. (laughs) All right. Like I'd love to have a nap, but like, kids little kids like my kids are eight and ten it's just like it's such like they act like it's the worst thing in the world to have to like go lay down oh my goodness <laughs> that's a great segue um napping and resting and energy leads me into my next uh question for you we know each other through pulse pulse p-e-m-f yep. and yep. Uh, you've been a user of our technology for ages and so um talk a little bit about you know, how that's worked in your practice and what you've seen, what you've used it for, just some of your thoughts around that. Well, I, I think it's kind of a no brainer. Like that's kind of how you guys meet me. Like I'll just walk by your guys' booth from there and next bow, come in for a charge. But like, it's a, it's an unattended therapy and it works. Like, um, you know, when I ended up getting COVID, I ended up using the pulse therapy. I brought the thing home and I was like using it to help myself get over it very quickly. And I got over it in a very short period of time. A lot of people complain about all this fatigue and I didn't really have that because I was using the pulse quite a bit. Don't get me wrong. It did not knock me on my butt for like a bit, like, uh, like a little over a day, but like, it's, um, you know, like I talked to people where they said they got this fatigue and brain fog for like weeks and weeks and weeks. It was like, I don't have any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So like, it's, um, I use it for all kinds of things, but like we have a few of them in the office. It's just part of our thing. If you have knee pain, you have back pain, you have shoulder pain, hip pain, no pain, you're getting pulsed. So like Mm -hmm. you just, it's just part of what you need. A lot of these people have like these de-energized cells. They have too many toxins. They got to get rid of the waste. They got to get the body into a healing state. And we just, every aside from pregnant people and people with pacemakers, Mm -hmm like the major contraindications, like we use pulse all the time. Yeah. And um, I've got my first one, the MG33 way back in the day. And then I upgraded that uh, when Paul upgraded it for the first time. And then um, the new ones are juggernauts. Like we could run them 36, 40 hours a week, just like clockwork. And they just run. Yeah. And they run and they run and then they run. They don't overheat. They don't break down. Like, yeah, like those like paddles and stuff like that do wear out, but they're cheap compared to the actual unit itself. So like uh, as far as the tech goes, I think the PEMF is one of my most favorite out there. Like, you know, like if I'm in the office working, um, like a lot of times I'll like go out there during non-patient hours, check my email, sit down, hook myself up. And I'm either listening to a podcast like this, or like, um, if it's something I could check my emails or do something, I'll just hook myself up and, uh, pulse out. Yeah, no. Awesome. A couple of things you said, you know, um, you, you mentioned a couple types of people that you might use it on. You said this kind of pain, that kind of pain or no pain. So that tells me 
that it's good for just about everybody, you know, unless yep. they're pregnant or have a pacemaker, like you like you pointed out, and that you know it's almost can be thought of as more of a vitamin than an aspirin. It's one of those things that just promotes. You said puts your body in a healing state. It doesn't do the healing. It just puts your body in the proper state is how you put it exactly for your and body um, to do what it does on its own and that's just an equation of energy a lot of times and that's so that's what our goal is is to put that energy into into people's body yeah like we use it all the time another thing i like about it it's um they're not as unique as they once were like when i first had them like in the very beginning people were like what the heck is that uh it's like now like you know you guys are getting more popular there's more celebrities and beamers and things like that out there. Uh, so it's not, it's easier to kind of recommend it. Now people are actually searching it out. Um, but it's still very, very unique. Like we're not the only one in the area that has them anymore, but like it's, they're not, they're far from ubiquitous. Yep. So like whether you're a physical therapist, a chiropractor, naturopath, holistic, uh, MD or something like that, I think it's a very unique thing to add to your practice. I'd recommend it. You know, like I got three of them, you know, like who knows, maybe add some more in the future. But like at this point, my focus is kind of more in a totally different business and not patient care anymore. Well, I appreciate that. Those are great comments. I appreciate the feedback. So in wrapping up, Doc, uh, if someone wants to reach out to you and get more information from you about your software or about your practice, where would you point them? Um, they could just find me at uh, trackstat.org, T-R-A-C-K-S-T-A-T dot org. Call uh, 760-334. 5013 texting is probably the easiest thing. So, uh, cause I do get calls to get my, uh, warranty for my car renewed along with buying solar along with, uh, someone just bought a package from Amazon and stuff like that, that we all get. We're all in the um, world together there. Yeah. yeah. So like, uh, so if you just call me out of the blue and don't say who you are, um, sometimes I can be a little standoffish a little bit. So a little quick text first lets me know that you're not one of them. That's cool. And uh, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me. Um, or you could just let me know I inherited $10 million from my uh, long lost uh, uncle in Africa. So. Absolutely. And we get those messages too on Instagram and in other places too. So you have to be, uh, you have to be a little bit discerning on all of those. Um, well, we really appreciate you being here today, Doc. And uh, I think it was a great conversation. I think people will enjoy it. And I will put those links and information below so people can access that. If you like what you see and hear on Resilient Business, please like, comment, and subscribe. And check out my partnerships uh, and affiliations down below for some great projects products and great discounts. Doc, again, I appreciate you being on Resilient Business. Have a great day. You too. Take care.